Uh, I told some people that when I was speaking on Ecuador, the title was going to be Where Trees, Oh, Trees That Do Not Make Shade. Because I used to work as a plant salesman at the Botanic Garden Center, and people would come in and say, We'd like a shade tree. And I would say, Would you like a tree that makes flowers? Would you like a tree that makes fruit? We don't have any trees that don't make shade. <laughs> you know, why wouldn't you use a dual purpose tree? Well, in Ecuador, I found there are trees that don't make shade. And the reason they don't make shade is that the sun rarely touches the ground directly. It's, it's not really the cloud forest in this area, but there are enough water particles in the air that the light bounces around. So the light is very indirect and you can see there is some shade under the truck. But under the tree, corn will grow right up under the tree. There are some young plants there. Here are a few corn plants here. All right, this is why I don't eat guavas. Rosa's brother Fernando. And he can stand up in that tree half a day. But listen, this is better than the citrus. He does the same with it. See how many fruit are on that tree? The ice cream bean? It's nothing. <laughs> he has feet like a bird because he'll stand up there with both feet on that pole and, he, and when he picks oranges he has to put a little pressure on it and I've fallen out of trees like that by putting pressure on it. Um, I, I ask him, I don't know if he's up that tree on the right or not, but I ask him one day, why don't you prune the trees so it makes it easier to harvest? And a few days later, the next time I was on his farm, he told me the tree on the left he had pruned. Now, <laughs> pruning to them means cutting off all the matapalo. Matapalo are parasites, but what they're pruning out are all of the orchids, ferns, and bromeliads. And there are hundreds because the air has so much moisture that there are a lot of epiphytes. Um, I had several photos of things that, uh, how many species of ferns, orchids, and so forth came out of that orange tree. Okay, this is an orange tree that cropped and pruned. I cut the top out. This one wasn't so big to begin with. This is on an incline, but at least I can reach every uh, fruit standing on the ground without a ladder. I asked someone, now, Fernando, in that big orange tree, will stand up there half a day hooking those oranges for his wife to pick up, put in a bag. At the end of the day, they have a, the bed of a pickup full, six or eight bags that he spent all day collecting. He takes them into town and sells them for a penny a piece. Two dollars a bag. Gets enough gas to go back to the farm the next day. And I said, you have to keep your trees low so you can pick them. So I asked someone at Amakale last week that was picking oranges. How many bags of oranges do you pick in a day? A hundred. <laughs> so I need to get your brothers up here and show them how we keep our trees short. Well, yes, they never get them all picked. There are orange trees all over the countryside. Uh, this is something that's a little hard for me to figure out. Why corn grows 15 feet tall? I don't know if you can see. Um, don't have my pointer stick. I have a pointer stick around here somewhere. But this guy is a medicine man that came out to the farm to uh, uh, walk through the jungle and identify plants that are used for medicine. And I said, how do you harvest corn? Because I could not begin to reach the ears of corn. And he, gra he grabbed the stalk and hit it with his knee, and then he hit it with his knee three more times and brought it down where he could pick the corn. But I think it's because of this, um, the corn elongates because of the uh, lack of uh, strong light. Um, I brought some of it up here so I could hybridize it with sweet corn and take it back. 
because they don't have sweet corn. This is a medicine man. Oh, and, and also papayas and this cactus. I don't think that would, certainly not where there are hurricanes, but near the, near the equator, we found through the years bringing plants from the equator to Florida, they are very susceptible to wind. Things like South America's poets, uh, because they don't get the strong winds that we get. Now, one thing that Rosa asked if I would do is try to identify some plants in the jungle that might be useful. And uh, we made, oh, we spent a lot of time out in the jungle uh, when we weren't uh, packing bananas for a shipment or other things. And um, we, we found a lot of interesting things. But the, one of the first days we went, I said, I mean, because the first time I looked at the jungle, I didn't know anything. And I said, well, today, let's just look for how many species of ferns and aeroids we can find. So we found, I think, three dozen, um, three dozen ferns and a couple of dozen aeroids. And it was about three o'clock. And you know it gets dark early in the tropics. It's 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of dark. And we had lunch. And Raul said, you know, Crafton, I'm thinking, this afternoon, why don't we go on the other side of the mountain? And I was so tired, you know, I'm not used to holding my balance on those steep inclines. <laughs> and I'm not used to someone else pushing me because I'm usually the one that says, let's go the other side of the mountain. But Raul was the one that was, he was always a step ahead. And one day when we were collecting ferns, he said, you know, we ought to put these between newspapers or something and dry them. And I said, Raul, you've just reinvented the herbarium. Someday let's go to Quito to the herbarium. Well, that man was a big hit in the herbarium in Quito. And we went together three times. And I'm sure every time he goes into town, he will, um, he will go back to the herbarium. Okay, in Ecuador, the Andes are sort of through the middle with the Amazon this side with all of its richness of the big cupuasu, the cacao relative South Americans opposed and those things. And I'd spent uh, very little time on the other side of the mountains, on the um, Pacific side of the mountains. But, oh, thank you. You found my sticks. Oh, you have a laser pointer? <laughs> well, oh, okay. Quito, I can't see it on the map, but Quito is along here somewhere in the mountains. And, and, and John and Jane are way down here in the mountains. But high altitude, much higher than Jim West. And Jim had told them that um, the plants at his place will not do well there. And some of Jim's plants don't do well for him. For example, I've taken lots of mangoes to him, hoping we would find some kind of mango, maybe um, some of the Thai mangoes that would not require a dry season that would fruit there. But they don't fruit there. So um, too cold and, and they collection of fruits, it saves a tremendous amount of time, you know, without taking things from here or getting from Asia. But to get to Jim's place, we had to come down almost to the coast and then come back up because that's the way the roads are. They don't go across the mountains the other direction. I was trying to, to um, later in my stay, I was trying to go to Jim West. I kept saying, you know, I need some time with Jim alone because we always talk about the latest changes in plant names and various things. What's 
the elevation of Quito? What's the elevation? Oh, that's 9,200 feet. Thank you. All right. I don't know elevation. So when I was when I was headed down there, I didn't know what plants to take. I asked Rosa what is growing there. Do they have mangoes? Do they have avocados? So forth. So I could get a feeling of what kind of plants grow there. So I was thinking, um, black sapotes and white sapotes are from the high altitudes, but they do perfectly well in Miami at sea level. And Maurice Kahn was saying, Crafton, because he's been brainwashed by Chris Rollins, they won't eat black sapotes. Well, Maurice, I have really good news. <laughs> Jose Mora in Rosa's hometown has black sapotes bearing and he drinks them like they drink all of their fruits. They either drink them with water and sugar or they drink them with milk. Even avocados in Brazil, they drink avocados. <laughs> But you know, if you, bring a, if you bring a pineapple, a watermelon, a cantaloupe in the house, and three days later you say, what happened to that cantaloupe? Oh, that was the fruit juice you had for breakfast, you know. It all ends, isn't it true? Most of the fruit, except for the guavas um, and, and bananas, they export bananas, but I had a terrible time finding bananas. Okay, uh, here is Quito, and there is, um, here is Quito. Santo Domingo de los Colorados. Uh, this long name refers to the Indians, the colored, the red people that uh, live there. And on the Saturday when I was supposed to be packing to leave, uh, Raul had planned to go out to the Indian reservation. By the way, they do have um, an Indian reservation, but Ecuador is one of the best places I know for integration, you know, where they have females and they have Indians uh, in the government. So it's, um, the people mix pretty well, but there are, the Indian reservation I'm looking forward to, to going to because of uh, uh, medicinal plants and so forth. So uh, Rosa's farm is within walking distance. Excuse me? It's not a reservation, it's their town. They are free to go in and out okay. anywhere. It's not okay, I'm giving the wrong impression of it, right? But it's just where historically they have been. They, that's their town. They, they, it became their town after the invaders took the whole lot of space. By the way, if you haven't been across Highway 41 in the last year, you can't believe how many Indian cheekies are out there now since they got electricity across. Okay, anyway, uh, from here, come down and back up to um, Pedro Vicente Maldonado. In this area is where uh, Jim West lives. I think I asked him to put a dot on the map where he is. Um, anyway, the third day we were there and we headed out for Jim West with the pickup truck. They didn't ask me for directions. And I had never been you know, I wouldn't think of going in one day. So I didn't know how to go because I'd always been on the other side of the river, the other side of the equator. But they had seen something about Jim West on television. And in the television report, it said, go to um, Mindo and ask. We went to Mindo and ask, and no one knew Jim West. And I said, well, of course not because he always travels on the opposite side of the, of the river. Uh, but later they told us they did have friends there. Okay, see, this is, this is the way uh, Jim girdles the tree. This is Mimi. The first day we got there, Jim was in town because Jim or Mimi take turns once a month going into Quito where he does his computer works and so forth. I'm most interested in this plant, which I'd seen at Jim's about 20 years ago. It has little oval bright red fruits and uh, I used to ask Jim, how do you know if those solanaceae are poisonous or edible? And um, with a little smile, he said, I feed them to my children. And his wife said, yes, we used to have 12. <laughs> they have two kids now that have their college degrees and are living in the U.S. 
Anyway, we left out in the dark. Oh, uh, Jim had this little, had the fruit of this uh, one time when I was down, and he went upstairs for something, and he came back. You know, he asked me to taste it, and he, he went upstairs for something, and when he came back, he was expecting to taste it also. And I said, Jim, it was so good, I ate it all. So I've been very much wanting to get that started. Jim thinks it's a viney spiny siphomandra, the tree tomato, which is very common there. But whatever it is, it roots very easily. This plant um, made roots, you know, in, in about three or four weeks. Uh, this is Jim's house. Um, it's really a very nice house. It has no walls. Jim lives like that. And they never had problem with security until they, now they have a road right through Jim's farm. But after the, after the road came through the farm, Mimi was wet, uh, met with a pistol in her head. Um, but still, you know, she knew the people that were doing it. They had come to the house asking for water a few days before. So whenever you, you leave the, the house, you take a basket. This is Mimi with the basket on her back to collect whatever is uh, ready to be harvested. Uh, these are some fruits from the, um, mostly from the Amazon side, the kupuasu, the big fruits. Uh, this is made, this photo is made on Jim's uh, workbench where he brings his fruit in for tasting and cleaning seeds. This big moldy fruit, uh, I'm having a senior moment. Uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, fruit that's green until it's ripe. It looks like a bowling ball, and then it's sort of like a black support. It turns very black and very soft. And Jim takes a piece of that fruit and makes a drink. It's supposed to be highly aphrodisiac. He can use the same fruit for a month. I thought maybe the mold was the accident principle, but they said it still works when it's fresh. Oh, they have some... Uh, this summer, while I was there, they had three um, people there for a few months, um, two from Germany and one from England, that paid, these three young people right here, that paid uh, $300 a month to sing a machete which really amused uh, Rosa's brothers. How can we get somebody to pay to come and work on our farm? Um, but that's partly because, and, and this is uh, making vinegar. Mim Mimi is teaching them how to make vinegar. This is, I think, Eugenia Uvala, fuzzy, very sour, what do you call that one? An araza, okay. But this one is, this is the one that's wild in your area, is it not? It's not, it's not, but cultivated. Okay. Very sour and very good drinks. How do you make a drink? You just... Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah. How do you make a drink out of it? Oh, well, it's sort of like making lemonade. They're just very sour. The, the first three times I went to Jim's house, I said when I finally got to his house, Jim, I will die here because I will never have the energy to get out of here. You know, you're so exhausted. And Jim just patiently starts handing you these drinks of Araza. Mm -hmm. And after three days, you think, yeah, I think, you know, in another week I can, and, and you'd have to, you know, before daylight, you would have to be to the top of the mountain to keep your schedule to catch the milk truck on time. Uh, this is the stump of a palm tree called Iriarte or palm or palm bill, very useful for making uh, houses and so forth. And Jim is using this one for his outdoor privy. Edward mangoes. And I never saw so many in one place in Miami. Yeah, in my house. You haven't been there when the mangoes blow and so Oh, I, enjoy, I enjoyed those so much. And they were cheap, you know, like $10. And on the right were grapes from Peru because, you know, um, the Europeans have been trying for 200 years to grow grapes and they finally have some that are doing pretty well. Now, you know, I said I was trying to go back to Jim West alone. I had planned to go by bus just so I could have time to talk. There's no way I'm going to Jim West ever alone again. 
because, and I wouldn't even think of it, uh, because these, uh, Raul Fernando, they want every excuse to go there. I talked to them a couple of days ago and I asked them if they'd been back. They haven't been since I left. But they will um, go when I get back again. So on the third trip, Raul, he has in his lap this book from Cartier, Costa Rica, with all the tropical fruits. And he is just devouring it. Jim photocopied it for him. I love those four-eyed puppies. Even when their eyes were closed, they looked like they were keeping guard. Um, this is a, a every, every uh, week or two, they would have a banana packing day when they would pa uh, package these little Orito bananas to go to um, Europe. Uh, I think they're here. I meant to try to find some. Oh, uh, have you seen them here? Oh, yeah. I buy every Saturday at the farmer's market. Oh, really? Yeah. You get the Oritos? Mm -hmm. My I goodness. Ate, I ate from my plant also. I had, I had but you know, that is something that never showed up in the house. And when we finished packing, you know, they had a ton or two to be fed to the pig, or they would say, just leave them for the cows. And I was always trying to take some to the house because, well, I mean, I tried to keep, tried to keep some ripening, but they were like, oh no, they're picked too green. You know, they have to pick them very early to have a slow ripening time to Europe. The farmer's market is the lady that has them, and she said it's down from, from, from uh, uh, I don't know, Homestead somewhere. Which farmer's market? Uh, the Coral Gables farmer's market. We are in every Saturday, and nobody visits us. It's the other <laughs> one. <laughs> I think some of the Cuban stores have them. Uh, no. No? No. They, they come from different areas, actually. OK. Uh, but also, public supermarket sells them once in a while. Uh, uh, very small and very good. Yeah. I, I much prefer them to. I love the ripe plantains, but I've never really appreciated green plantains. But green plantains were like uh, daily fare along with cassava. I, I've, you know, I've seen Elvia go out after dark to pull up a cassava for supper. Of course, it gets dark early there. Um, I think the prize winner would be anyone who can tell what this contraption is for. It has an automobile tire on the top. It's bamboo. They put that so that um, when you feed the baby chickens, the uh, adults don't eat it all up from them. Pardon? That's at Elvia's house, at Guevara's. Yeah. Is that news to you? I haven't seen it. At, at your house, they use uh, just wire yeah. where the little chicks can go in. Um, this, this is a Guevara's um, sugar cane juicer. You know, it has, it has a big turn pole that they turn by a horse. And this is a child's version. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that's a child's version that doesn't work too well because it takes a lot of power to get the juice out of a sugar cane. It's very tough. Oh. Okay, I'm trying to think. This tree is a white triplaris. Uh, there is also laurel, which is common there with white flowers. And I'm trying to figure out if this is an orange. I guess it's an orange. What else? No. It's not orange? Look at that leaf. I forgot why I made it now. Uh, we did find a um, one Brazil nut relative on the farm. Not the Brazil nut that we use commercially here, which comes. Is that come, a lucuma? Excuse me? Is that a lucuma? I didn't see lucuma there. Lucuma is high altitude, you know, like up around. Um, um, well, in the high altitudes. Lucuma, for you, you who uh, don't understand, is, is like an egg fruit, but it's, a, it's like a dry, mealy egg fruit. Where did, do you make drinks out of those? Where are you from? Fruit. I don't know you. Who are you? Jim. 
uh, Abe Wolfison. My, this is my first day. Uh, Matthew invited me here. Oh, really? So you're from, did you grow up in Peru or where? In the, in the high altitude? No, no, in Lima, uh, sea level. Lima in sea level? Lima's not sea level. Sure it is. Yeah. yeah. used to go to the beach every day in the summer. <laughs> well, it's a lot different from Iquitos. Um, this is just top working some, um, this is back at the Cuadrado farm. We brought these pomelos from Yomues and, and also from from your cousin Lucho. Lucho has a good collection of citrus. Uh, Rosa has so many cousins that we were spent all summer. Um, but this is something interesting. So I said how, how quickly things happen, like arrived on Wednesday, got the plants in the nursery on Thursday. On Friday, we were off to Jim West and back the same night. I'm trying to think. No, we overnighted. We came back the next morning. On Saturday night, at your mother's dinner table, there was a bouquet of roses, which your sister had bought from the floral market. And someone that had, because your brothers did their first grafting that day, that morning, avocados. And that night, they pulled a rose out of the base, cut a few inches off the bottom, and Raul said, now Crafton, tomorrow we will sleep late. At six o'clock, the kids were downstairs. At seven o'clock, Elvia was out grafting this rose. You know, usually when you, you see the buddies right here, and usually when you, you graft anything, it's going to be a month before you know whether it's alive or not. In three days, this rose had pushed the bud through the parafilm, and this photo was made three weeks later. <laughs> so, um, I mean, some things grow really well. Another thing that we grafted early on was um, tomatoes onto a wild plant. Maurice, what is this plant? Susumber. Susumber? <coughs> Tell us something about it. The only places that I know that people eat susumber, by the way, it's illegal to grow this in the U.S., um, because I took some to PK Oriental and next time I was in they gave me a little card craft and call this number I didn't know we had Nazi plant policemen going through Publix and everywhere saying you can't have this plant Why? anyway what makes it illegal? I guess it it's it can be a pesky weed when I was in Peace Corps in Africa they had two weeds, one they call number one and one number two, that just grew all over the place. You know, when they cut the jungle and after they had their first rice harvest, they would abandon it to let it uh, fallow. And the, the first plants that came in were two species of solanaceae that would grow about 15 feet tall. And they were very pesky. And they blamed, blamed it on me, you know, these came from your country. And I said, well, not from the U.S., but I found out that uh, this one is native to Ecuador. Now, the reason I asked Maurice is because Maurice grew up in Jamaica. His wife is from Thailand. And those are the only two places in the world that I know that people eat these things. And they are horribly bitter. <laughs> well, if you're not used to eating bitter things, I've finally gotten used to them where I can tolerate them, but my soup would still be better without them. They're, they're very bitter. Uh, but when, when I think that with our government, this is considered a weed, it makes me angry because I was at uh, Roberto Baterno's in Homestead one day, um, 10 years ago or more. And while I was there, uh, Roberto is a Filipino farmer. And while I was there, there was a Thai grocer that came in and bought two bushel of these things and they were just clipped off. They weren't picked one by one. He bought two bushel and paid $180 for them. So that's the kind of weed I'd like to grow. <laughs> but, um, okay, we grafted, in this case, it's a little uh, cherry tomatoes because they're not so heavy uh, to break the things off. You have to tie them up a lot. Okay, this is a graft of that. Um, not in here? 
with the black leaf, it's, it's not fully grafted yet. You know, it's still in the wilted state. But every, every night it perks up and in the day it wilts. And finally, after a week or so, it's growing. But I was down there only 10 weeks and these things were fruiting. So it's fun to graft something that's going to be fruiting fast. Um, I wanted to graft eggplants, but I could not find an eggplant in the country. We found eggplants in the market, and your family had never eaten them before. It's not popular. Uh, we, we did graft several things under that. Okay, this is a guy that has, um, his farm is so interesting. Uh, Jose Morta, the guy with the black support that drinks it with milk, makes milkshake. This is his house, not showing up very well, but it's made of that palm called palm bill. And he has the most delicious animal in the world, which is what? Cui. Is what? Cui? Cui. Cui is delicious, and it's almost exactly like agouti. In this case, he, was, he had agouti, but he was feeding them zamia seeds. And I said, you can kill yourself. You know, it, uh, zamia seeds, it's a long story, but zamia seeds, there was a, from what? Oh. <laughs> This is swinging on a rope out over a valley. I couldn't even watch this. And after dark, and your sister Rebecca was on that. We used to throw ourselves from a swing like that into the river. There was no water below. It would have been a lot safer. It, it was just like, you know, down the cliffside. This was in an area where Jose Mora had a lot of mango seeds, right there in Santo Domingo. And this is at Jose Mortis. This is uh, uh, Combritum, which they have at Fairchild Garden. Okay, I have a plant or two of this. It's probably not edible. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's, uh, I wouldn't try to eat it. If somebody wants those plants, I have a couple of little plants. This is a group from Germany that were on a tour in the jungle. Um, the guy pointing out rat catcher and various things. Oh, I do want to point out this fern, because when they did the Mayfair, I was looking for this fern, which I'd seen in Colombia, which hangs, you know, 12, to cascade between the floors. Just an incredible fern. And this is uh, onions. Um, I, the kids wouldn't volunteer to be painted with Bixa, so I volunteered. These people are from Germany. The Orito ba banana. These uh, palm trees, they are better when they've been on the ground a year or so, so they've brought it out inside and aren't so heavy. Um, Jim West has measured those at uh, 90 feet. Rose's brother, Raul, this little palm, we still don't have identified, but uh, because it's cool and cloudy, we thought it might take air conditioning and the shade. It might be a good indoor palm, so we might have a market for seed. In the upper right corner is Jim West with the fruit that he has lost an ID on. I think it's a uh, strychnine. which is edible if you're careful. This is Raoul in the herbarium. Raoul knows his plants. He just doesn't know botanic names for them, but he can find a leaf on the ground. For example, the Amazon tree grape has a version on the other side of the mountains. The fruit are not so big, and the trees are so tall that people almost never eat it. But the leaves that fall on the ground, you can use for sandpaper, and I used it on that mahogany table. We'll spend, the next time I go, we'll spend a lot of time in the herbarium. People there are very nice. Some, some cucurbit. Um, 
We found a species of bamboo, that's a tobacco. I've only seen tobacco twice in the wild, but it's not native there. It's native much further south in South America. Okay, the flower with the white. Everyone in here knows that. It's 20 feet tall up in the tree. Begonia. <laughs> Begonia. And I think, uh, I, I don't know if I have a picture of that Brazil nut. An unidentified tree that's growing on the farm. It puts flowers out of the trunk a lot like um, durian. And this plant would grow fine in Tennessee. By the way, in, uh, the plants in Quito would be much happier in Tennessee than in Miami. Almost everything in Quito. The ashes, sycamores would grow in Tennessee. Um, Rosie, do you remember this? They call it chiguilla, Chigu chiguilla. Uh, I, not edible. Looks like a big durian. And this is a version of the South American zapote, a smaller version. And this is an avocado relative. And this is a Eugenia. And this, we have no idea what that is. Uh, this is a papaya relative that they eat the leaves. They call it uh, cabbage of the mountain or col de monte. <coughs> they grow from just a stick. And bulmarias, which are common in the high altitudes. Oh, this is... This, pardon? That's not Crafty. Can you yeah. come back another time? And yeah, we got to go. That's Bomeria from the high altitudes. Is that avocado? The avocados were needed there. Okay, this is the, the Brazil nut. This is one that I don't think Raul had seen on the farm before. And I was surprised because he's pretty astute about things like that. Um, there are many species of Lithysis. And this one wasn't fully ripe when we were there. That's a close-up of it. Amazon lilies. This is an orchid. Uh, Bob Pemberton has done some work with the oh, euglossid bees. Well, it's and all this I, I don't know if it's the same. It looks like it. And okay. It's managed to survive on other plants than the orchid. And the way they pollinate, especially Solanaceae, is the vibration of their wings causes a pollen to shed. Because I've tried to hand pollinate Solanaceae, and it's almost impossible to get the pollen to move. Okay, this is the guava. This is the ice cream bean, and Rose's cousin, uh, Nelson, uh, came out to the farm, and they cut the tree down. I was proud of them, <laughs> instead of risking their life, because they know by next year it'll be back, and they have plenty anyway. Shortly, shortly before I left, one Saturday morning, Raul cooked breakfast, and his wife, Elvia, on the right said, Raul, our chickens are sick. Raul jumped in the truck. I didn't know where he was going, and my Spanish is not so good. And when he was gone, I was thinking, oh, I haven't heard the news in months. I know that Vi that chicken virus, we can have the lights, I think. I know that chicken virus, um, what do they call it? Bird, bird, flu. bird flu has come with the migratory birds, because it was October, into Ecuador. And I'm probably going to be stuck in this country the rest of my life. <laughs> when Raul came back from town, I was asking, is it bird flu? And he said, no. We've had it before. It's in Newcastle's. But you know, it, and, and like one of the neighbors said, well, if you get the vaccine fast, it'll save the chickens that don't have it. But it won't uh, save the ones that already have it. It can really, uh, that's why he left without uh, eating breakfast. It's because it works very fast. OK, anyway, thanks to Rosa. And thanks, uh, well, it, it was a fantastic trip. So now, uh, you know, then, but the next time I go, I'm go I have to take some durians and some things that uh, are hard to get from Jim West.
Thank you, thank you very power. much. Well, he, he, he had a hydroelectric from his waterfall. And, um, but now he depends mostly on solar. He goes into Quito to do his uh, computer work. I mean, he has a computer at home, but he can't send messages and so forth. He, he does quite a seed business. He and his wife were going to uh, Asia for a month right after I left, but they had someone to stay in their house because, you know, there are no doors, there are no walls. They had somebody to stay in their house and keep up their seed business. Well, his wife, you know, after they put the road through, somebody came with a gun to her head. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. And we hope you'll yeah. come back. Pardon? Why, why would somebody put a gun to her head?